All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Logan with the County of Ventura and Reese Wren. I'm a program manager of our workforce education and training program. Um, we are all gathered here for getting past key pump objections with Larry Waters of Electrify My Home. Um, we've got good stuff planned for for this morning. So happy to happy to see you all here. And um, if you'd like to, you're welcome to um, introduce yourself in the chat. Maybe just who you are and where you're tuning in from. Um, and I'm just going to roll through a couple housekeeping slides before we get started. Next slide, please. All right. Um, and I guess just a forewarning, um, I feel like we're all pretty comfortable on Zoom at this point. But um, if you guys do want to engage and ask questions, feel free to do so in the chat. We'll address them as they come up um, and then open it up for Q&A at the end for any unanswered questions or anything that comes up towards the end. Um, just a few words about who we are. Uh, the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Red. We're a collaborative partnership of the counties of Slo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura, meant to improve energy efficiency in the region by offering free programs and services for primarily building professionals and households. Uh, we're funded by ratepayer dollars that we all pay into through our utility bills. Uh, the benefit of being ratepayer funded is that typically there's no cost to those we serve, and we're able to return these dollars back to the lo our local economy uh, instead of being um, distributed throughout the entire state. Next slide, please. Um, we currently offer three programs. We have our Energy Code Connect program where we offer industry training, regional forums, and a Title 24 consultation service called the Energy Code Coach. Um, I've listed our, our phone number for our hotline here on the slide. Uh, there's also an inquiry form on our website. If you do have any Title 24 questions that come up either in the office or in the field, feel free to reach out. We pride ourselves on a 24-hour turnaround um, to get those questions answered. Um, the reason we're all here today are building performance training program where we offer trainings on technical and soft skills related to building science principles and systems for high performance buildings. Super, super quiet. Our, our, our goal with this one is to bring industry recognized certification and training providers to the Central Coast that'll help advance people wherever they may be at in their career. Um, and then lastly, our home energy savings program, which serves households that are historically underserved with free and discounted home energy upgrades. If you or any of your clients are looking to make energy efficiency or electrification upgrades in your home, please check out our website. Uh, you'll find our directory of enrolled contractors to work with. And if you are a contractor yourself and interested in participating, you can reach out directly or you can fill out an inquiry form on our website and we'll connect you with someone that will get you enrolled in the program. Um, with that, thank you. And I will leave it to Larry and Alex this morning. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Did you all hear me telling my staff to be quiet in the background of, while being loud? Uh, anyway, uh, good morning. Thank you guys for joining us. Real quickly in the chat, um, just so we get a feel for who's in the class, would it be possible for everyone to just type their role in the chat um, and what company you come from? Uh, anyway, my name is Larry Waters. I've been uh, an HVAC guy since uh, a really, really long time ago, 1982. Um, the good old days, as we call them. Uh, if we If we kind of base our calendar on what tools were available. That was, yes, before the first cordless drill. I'm a NATE certified uh, service technician, and I have been certified for over 24 years in heat pump installation uh, service and all of the ancillary things that come along with that. Uh, I've been certified as a BPI, Building Performance Institute Certified Building Analyst since 2009, 2010, and I've only been installing heat pumps since 2015. 
as you might imagine, back in 2015, this was before like this push for heat pumps in California. The reason we were installing a lot of them back then to replace gas systems in gas houses was because through BPI, we were tightening, using our building building science shops, we were tightening up houses and making them efficient to where we couldn't find furnaces that were small enough. So we started installing these uh, sweet little inverter heat pump systems back in 2015 and really never looked back. Um, also then around 2019, I says, I'm either gonna retire or I'm gonna uh, start this hobby business that now has just turned into um, way more than a hobby, I would say. Anyway, so that's kind of my story. Electrify My Home has been around since 2020. Since then, we've grown uh, exponentially one year, and then we've grown significantly the other two years. And now we're uh, a company of about uh, 14 employees. We have nine field people, and um, we're doing uh, um, about 12 heat pump installations a month. I always share our mission statement um, with everybody that we train and also all of our customers. Uh, we have a very unique way of engaging with our customers. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, our mission statement is to provide the most efficient, cost-effective electrification solutions. Be a good steward of the electrical panel. Most of the time we're doing full electrification projects on existing 100 amp panels. It's definitely easy, easy and possible. Uh, but not without, you know, customers have to make some sacrifices. And then the other part is to train and influence other contractors to do the same. The uh, kind of the origin story of when the company was started was right uh, really about two, well, about two months before the two weeks to stop the spread. And um, I originally wanted the company to be a consulting business and a training business. And um, because everything got put on hold during the pandemic, we became a contracting business. So now we have lots, lots of lots of plates spinning right now. But we do travel all over the state with Tech Clean California. We also provide trainings for some of the other investor-owned utilities in the state, and uh, just trying to push the message that electrification of a home is far more than just putting a heat pump in. We got through the introductions here. Um, so we're gonna talk about consultative approaches to identifying needs and matching solutions. Go into that a little bit. Uh, my training styles, I talk, I, I, I tell some stories to help uh, bring everything around. So we'll, we'll get a couple stories there. We're gonna talk about the common objections and how we, you know, our sample responses or how we want to respond to those are kind of our canned responses. Obviously, this is not a scripted um this is this is not a scripted uh a sales process we have to understand who our customers are we're getting into a little bit more of that so the responses are general in the in the fact that you need to frame those in the conversation with the customer um so that uh it fits their particular personality and then at the end we'll wrap up and answer some questions Okay, before we get started, I'm just going to check the chat out. Oh, we got Pepper Hunsaker. I know this. I know this person. We've got homeowners, marketing managers, architects, sustainability committee, creative dire directors. Uh oh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have asked this question. Um, and we got some other people in here. So it doesn't look like any direct contractor. So we'll take this for what it is. All right. So a little off, off kilter on my slides this morning. So con consultative approaches to identify needs and matching solutions. This is the first six steps to get this started. This is probably the most important part of any sales process. And it's something that we take very seriously. Um, we approach every customer differently. And we spend the first five or 10 minutes, we talk to the customer. It's a little harder for us because we all of our initial 
conversations are virtual. Um, but we're spending the first period of time with the customer really trying to pin them down on one personality type they are. And we're fortunate because of the way we market and kind of where we get a lot of our business that most of our customers fit into a couple of different um, uh, a couple of different categories of the four categories we'll talk about. So it's easy to pick them out and it's easy to gear the conversation towards that specific personality type. Um, but you have to know what it is. <clears throat> we work on this approach where um, we we lay out all the facts in a way that that our customers are going to respond to them in a different way, depending on what their personality is. We want to handle all of the objections up front. And I've always called sales is basically the um, a hotel hallway with all the doors open. And then there's one door at the end that's the elevator. And I'm trying to get to the elevator. But in order for me to get to the elevator, which is cost, I have to shut all these other doors along the way. And so basically what we're doing is these doors are the are the factual information I'm giving the customer. And once I shut these doors along the way, I can get to that end door, which is really, can they afford what I'm doing or, or at least get to talk about um, the dollars and cents of the program? Because what we don't want to do, we want to eliminate any kind of questions along the way and frame this these um, discovery period that we do and uh, frame that towards answering the questions of the customer based on their personality type. So let's get right into that part. Okay. So before we jump into addressing uh, objections, we have a three-step kind of process that we do and it's, and it's become very subconscious at this point, but as we're doing it, as we train this, we, we train, contractors on how to understand these cues and how to get to the bottom of what your customer's personality type is and um, communicate with them on that level. So what we want to find out first is their personality. Uh, this is this is just done through conversation. Then we want to get all their concerns on the table. And a lot of times this is going to reinforce like who they are. And then we want to drill down and get to their needs. We don't spend a lot of time talking to customers about things that don't matter to them. So it's really important to do like the needs assessment right away. And that's the doors as we're going down through and finding out what the customers kind of, um, I, I won't say pain points, but but the their, their, their points of interest that outweigh things that they don't care about. Uh, we need to understand their home. We need to understand kind of what their what their plan is totally. Like, are they going to fully electrify? Do they understand what that that looks like? Um, where are they on their pathway? What's been done already? Say a lot of the houses we go into, the customers have already invested in a new electrical panel or they've got solar. Some of them we we talk to, they've already got the stove. That was their that was their first thing that they did. And usually that ends up being the last thing most people do. But uh, the other thing is we want to understand their panel condition, uh, what we're going to be able to do with that panel so that we can develop a, a good um, plan that's going to revolve around. Are they planning on a panel upgrade? Do they have big improvements coming up? What are the strategies we can do to get them to their goals with their existing panel or at what point in the conversation or their journey are they going to have to look at changing that panel we try to emphasize not changing a panel on customers houses um, that say don't have solar or don't have a car charger yet we want to put in systems that are going to work in their existing house and their existing infrastructure and then we let those panel upgrades come with this with the renewables uh, we want to make sure there's space available in the panel or or build a strategy on how we're going to devise that space. And then we want to address uh, the, at that point, once we've figured all these things out and we've got all of our ammunition, this is with an understanding of the customer. We want to uh, uh, address their objections and we want to do that understanding what their objections are going to be because they're going to come out. They're going to come up throughout the the um, the conversation, but most of the time inquiries and, and requests for more information or just them being curious about whatever 
point we're talking about is going to be the indicator of the objections we can close along the way, but we don't know till the end what the true objections are, and we want to get down to price if we can. So we need to do that with an understanding of the customer's personality and a understanding of their home. So we always say that we need to come prepared. We we're, we're, we're a little bit of a different company. We don't do any gas whatsoever. So, um, and we don't handle one brand. We're not brand oriented like a lot of HVAC companies are where they just are there. They have a dealership agreement with a specific brand, kind of like, you know, the Ford dealer sells Fords. Some of the heating and air conditioning companies sell carrier or train or whatever that might be. And they might have one sub brand. More and more companies now are carrying a inverter style heat pump brand as a secondary brand as well. But all of these, all of these manufacturers, their systems don't all work the same way. And it's important that we understand how they work. Um, so we sell five different brands because of the way the systems work and tailoring them to the specific application and where the customer is in their, in their quest or journey. And we make sure that we communicate that to the customer so they understand that we're not going to make a recommendation based on what's best for us. We're going to make the recommendation based on what's best for their particular project. So um, we got a lot of training and stuff out there. If you just want some, uh, get some more information from the Electrify Efficiently series, um, you can use that to load your gun, get, get your information um already so you understand what you're talking about still trying to figure out uh, another way of saying this that doesn't you know conjure up weapons but unfortunately a lot of our vernacular is around that get your facts straight know how your systems work know what the outcomes are going to be understand what's going to fit where and how it's going to work and understand how people's houses work and and the application challenges we're going to see and address those challenges up front. So you got to really get your facts straight. Uh, we do this in our in our remote classes as we have an exercise where we go through the, there, there's really five things we'll share those with you. Features or benefits or, or, um, or things that your customer is going to be excited about. There's really five of them that we surround our conversations with. And we, we practice and we, and we get our guys thinking about how do I make an opening statement to my customer to, to figure out if this is their, um, what we should be concentrating on, if this is their need. Because when, during sales, the most effective sales process is discovering need and then, then basically doubling down on what the customer needs, not talking about stuff that they don't need because it's just a waste of time and you can disconnect with them because they, they think you don't understand what's going on. So needs-based sales is the most effective that we've found. I've been selling HVAC equipment since, I don't know, uh, 90, I moved into my house up here in 97. So 93, I started doing sales of HVAC equipment. I didn't really understand different sales approaches over time, but different companies had different ways of selling. And, um, but I found that the, a, a consultative approach where we seek out the needs is, is the most effective way. So find out what these opening statements are. We'll go into this a little bit more and, um, and practice those, figure out what you're going to say. A lot of contractors, unlike us, you know, our, our company name is Electrify My Home. We only do heat pumps. People that are calling us are calling us because they want heat pumps. When I was first selling heat pumps back in 2015, it was in lieu of a sale of a, of a furnace, right? I was, I was effectively communicating the benefits of heat pumps in lieu of the furnace to get the customer to get away from the idea that they wanted a gas, another gas furnace. Um, and that takes a little bit more finesse. So this is where you really want to get your opening statements down. Uh, we do transitional statement um, in, in our training of how we're going to take that customer that thinks they're calling about a new furnace. And we're going to transition the conversation over to um, why electric is, is a better way to go. And we base this on the, the five facts like we we're talking about. But figure out what those opening statements are going to be really drive in on those and, and get them down and practice them. Understand your products. 
if you have uh, one brand of heat pumps, you should know what it can do and can't do. Don't make promises that aren't going to be kept up. If you only sell unitary heat pump systems, you might be missing out on some opportunity for some comfort, some some energy savings and some sizing. Most companies now are carrying a secondary brand of like inverter stuff that'll fit and is a little quieter. Um, so it, it, it fits more applications, especially in the cities. But you need to understand how your products work, the, the capacity ranges, what you're going to need for the house. Uh, we had a house yesterday. The customer really needs new windows. Um, they're not going to have new windows installed probably for a couple of years. So we need to put a system in there that's going to have enough capacity for their house while it's less efficient. But it also has enough turndown capacity. So when they put these new windows in and they get rid of the knob and tube wiring and they insulate the attic, the house is going to become much more efficient. I want to put a system in in that house that is going to be able to give them the service they need now efficiently and then automatically adjust to the to the new efficiency of the house. So certain products do that better than others. And then have faith in your solutions. If you back your solutions with building science and, and kudos for you guys for being on this call today, this is all part of this. 3C RIN, a lot of the other utilities in the state um, have a lot of training around building science. It's really important that we that we um, engage building science when we're when we're flipping customers from furnaces to heat pumps, because obviously we're we're heating houses with sometimes 30 percent of the capacity or less of their existing furnace. So it's really important that we understand how the house works, what insulation is going to do, how to seal air leaks properly, how to identify problems with the house. Uh, this is really, really important stuff when we're transitioning to heat pumps. We want to take the opportunity when this customer is transitioning away from gas and into electric to improve their life and not cause them a whole bunch of new headaches. So this is a big part of this whole thing too. approach as you uh, or observe as you approach. Look at the houses you're going to and understand what we're walking into. So we show these pictures to the people in our class. Um, and so we're, we, we always recommend that you check the house out <clears throat> before you go out on uh, Street View or uh, Redfin or Zillow or truly are good sources. If the house has been sold a lot of times in the last 10 years, sometimes there's 20 or 30 pictures up there um, that you can really get kind of a tour of the house before you ever go out to kind of help you um, just understand what you're looking at before you go out. If, 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 if we're driving out to a customer's home, that driving period that we're driving that customer's house, as salespeople, we're thinking about this customer on the way out. If we go with our, with, with um, some information already in our head, like, What's the house look like? What's the what's the square footage? When did it sell? Um, how much is it worth? All these things are really important in the conversation when you get there, right? And then we're approaching the house like this. I mean, we've got a couple of different scenarios here. So be observant as you approach the customer's house. Like if they have, uh, if if you go to a customer's house like these guys, these 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 folks here super proud of their electric car that they spent $20,000 on that will only go 40 miles, right? These people are seriously committed. Probably means they might work from home, so they don't need a car to commute in. They've got a lot of solar on the roof. They don't have any grass in the yard. These are all good signs that these people are, are going to be willing to listen to uh, the more efficient approaches that you have available. When we look at houses like this, we know aesthetics is going to be probably the primary goal. This is not a house that we're going to want to put a bunch of line cap up the, up the front or do a bunch of uh, wall units throughout the house, although you may because there's not a lot of roof space in here. Just looking at this house makes me think that, um, you know, it, hopefully it was designed and built correctly uh, from the get-go and you can put a new system on the existing infrastructure and it will work because good luck trying to get in the walls or in, in anywhere here. And, um, you know, this, this customer is going to be really, really dialed in about how this thing looks. This guy down here probably doesn't matter as much about how the system looks on the outside, but we also don't want to predetermine our, our, our house here. This is obviously this person has some sort of a lawn. This lawn is a what you call a rain lawn, right? Uh, it grows up because there's nothing there after the rain and it turns into 
ugly orange stuff later. This is just a house that's not well taken care of. Doesn't mean they don't want to be comfortable. Um, they might want a less expensive solution, but don't tune this in as you walk in the door. These people might want to be wanting to look at the next upgrade and and part of their remodel includes actually like getting rid of all the junk in the front yard. That may be the case. I haven't found uh, that to be the case in most houses you walk up to that are like this. Um, usually they're a bear to get around on the inside. Usually the out outside is a reflection of what it's going to be on the inside. So, you know, what would you think walking up to a house like this? This is really drought tolerant landscape because it only grows when it rains. And then, you know, they don't worry about it after that. This one right here, this is an interesting one. And uh, this is kind of a, uh, a, 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 a tale of two possibilities, right? They have the Hummer in the driveway and they have a massive amount of solar on the roof. Um, they got a little snow there too. And this obviously looks like an East Coast house. Um, this is not one of our customers' homes, but <clears throat> it's another one. When you when you walk up to this house, what are you thinking? Like these people had ultra high utility bills. They put enough solar in to cancel it out. Do they have a lease here? Did they, was it a knock on the door solar guy and they're just doing it because of the neighbor? So all of these things are things that we have to consider and part of what we're going to find out. I will tell you there's not a lot of C and S personalities. They're going to have a Hummer in the front yard. That's a good indicator that you're dealing with an I or a D. Um, so uh, this one right here is definitely uh, not an I. I can tell you that. What we want to do is, is uh, take some time to chat with a customer and build rapport. We know this as salespeople that uh, this is the most important step. This is where we're going to be able to determine what our customer's personality type is by um, engaging them in some simple conversation. So we're going to listen to some clues. We're going to ask them some pointed questions um, and conversationally, right? We're going to get in, um, share our smile. We're going to be observant and complimentary of their home. Uh, I would say if you're going into a house that has noticeable upgrades from the neighborhood and you don't acknowledge them, like if you did that at my house, you would lose me immediately. So, uh, but I'm an I type personality. That's why I like to do sales. The, um, you know, I, 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 I make my stuff look good because I want it to look good. And when people recognize that, you can really hit on an I-type personality. Look for conversation starters. We joke about this in our class. And, and um, sometimes there's, we go into some houses and being in this trade for, for 40 years, we've gone into every kind of house. We always wear shoe covers when we go in the house. Sometimes it's to protect our shoes. Sometimes it's to protect the customer's carpet. It's going to be different. And then that's going to, that's going to take you to where the, where the conversation goes. Uh, but there's always something looking for that conversation starter. This is the point where we want to pinpoint their personality type. We'll talk a little bit more about this in subsequent slides. But there's four basic personality types. We have analytical people. We have those guys are the engineers of the world. We have the empathetic people. These are the people that want to save the world. We have the influencer. These are the people that want to talk about things like salespeople, like myself. Good salespeople are usually um, high eyes. And then you've got the driver or the alpha. Those are two of the same things. Um, the driver personality is, is going to be a little bit different. They're more direct. If you're an HVAC guy, that's the guy you knock on the door and you hear the garage door open and the guy says, there it is. That's the D-type personality. Pretty easy to determine that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about that. We have um, four basic personality types. If, if anybody in the audience wants to learn a little bit more about themselves and be able to understand people and you've never done a DISC profile test, there's several places online where you can take this test for free. It's really easy. And... Um, and you, it, it, it's basically a test that are you more like this or more like this? And it will help determine where you are and how what your point of uh, communication is. We do find that D type people that have found their way into sales are often the ones that uh, really just want to like get the job at the lowest cost, not worry about anything, get in, get out, get it done. They, they, these don't lend themselves to high ticket averages. 
the I personalities are enthusiastic people that want to talk about things and want to make sure that the customer understands everything, every feature, everything they can do. Sometimes as I personality types, we really need to just slow down a little bit and spend a little time uh, focusing on the psychology of who we're talking to. And just these are the people that the term uh, you have two ears and one mouth, use them accordingly. Uh, eyes have a hard time doing that. And if we're talking to a C or an S, um, especially the C person, we're going to need to be really, really detail oriented. Uh, we're going to have to know our facts. And um, we're going to have to get in there and um, and uh, be ready to share the specifications of the system, you know, the energy efficiency. These people are going to be a little ROI-ish, but not as much as the D personality. These people are really going to want to make sure that they've uh, crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's in their search for the right contractor as well as the right product. And these people might have done research um, online. These people are the ones that have done research, but they might be the ones that are that are expecting you to put a, a unit on the wall in every room because they've read that's good and they don't know the other options. It might take a little talking to get them away from that. The S's are, they just, they're, a lot of these people really want to do the right thing for the environment and their grandkids. And they, they, they want to uh, make sure that, that um, they're, they're doing the right thing. So you have to approach them from, you know, how this is going to save the world. Here's a little bit more of a detail on that. Some of the questions you might get, you got the sympathetic. We had this the other day and the husband and wife couple, um, he was more analytical. She was more sympathetic. The, her question for us was, um, I know that refrigerant is bad. It's just this exact question. I know that the refrigerant is bad. Um, should I wait for the units that come out with a new refrigerant? And so her husband's position was, if we do that, we're going to be waiting two more years and we're going to pay all this electric cost in the meantime. And we're going to, you know, we shouldn't probably do, wait that long. Um, she was responsive to having a smaller system put in her house because it uses less refrigerant, getting away from a multi-zone system because there's less chance for leakage. And then um, the other part was she, uh, I also informed her like anytime a new product comes out and it's a new lineup, it takes a while for the industry to catch up and it takes a while for the people that are installing to catch up. So really if she was going to wait for the new refrigerant, she should wait an additional couple of years to where it's uh, everybody knows what they're doing with the new refrigerant. Uh, these are the people that are worried about the disruption, the disruption and how long it's going to take and, and um, you know, what is, what's going to be happening with the house. Those people are a little bit about that, but they're also the ones that are going to understand, like if they have a lath and plaster house, Mrs. Jones, sometimes when we cut these holes in the ceiling, there's a little bit of breakaway from the, you, you have to understand we will take care of that might not be done on the first day. Um, and they're going to understand that sort of thing. Uh, the influencer is going to worry about what their friends think. And uh, this is funny here. This this, this uh, sample question here is my friends won't like the look of two outdoor units. Can you do one of these instead? Um, sometimes these people actually get their information from people outside of the um outside of the trade so they'll ask their neighbors and kind of chat about it and say hey i'm thinking about getting a heat pump because they want their friends to know that they're what they're doing all the time and then they will actually elicit those answers from the from the neighbor across the street may have no information about it that tells them you know i heard heat pumps aren't that good whatever they're gonna they're gonna hear this information um a lot less likely to go do research beyond the periphery and um are they gonna want they're going to want the bells and whistles though, right? So they're going to want a modern system. They're going to want to see if it's got the Wi-Fi controller or they're the ones a lot of times along with the, along with the um, analytical, but they're going to want the energy monitor system, but they're going to be the ones to get it so that they can show their friends and they're never going to look at it, right? The analyticals are going to be the ones that are going to look at it every day and see what their energy is doing. So, 
these guys, um, influencers who are usually sale or a lot of times salespeople um, are really easy to sell. A, a salesperson is extremely easy to sell. It's one of the reasons why I don't like salespeople coming into my house because I'm, I bought a rainbow vacuum one time and whoever designed the rainbow vacuum sales process was really smart because they put all the features and benefits of the thing in. And then they come to the thing where you need the wand the power wand to actually clean the floor and it shows a price on there of $1,200 for the wand. And um, me being the influencer that I am and thinking I'm a great salesman. Um, I told the guy, well, I'm not going to buy it unless that's in it, you know, unless you're going to give me the wand for free. And he flips the next page and he says, if you buy it today, the wand is free. So I really sold the thing to myself and I ended up buying a $1,500 vacuum cleaner. So um, I don't like it when those people come to the house uh, because I end up buying stuff. Cause I'm an influencer. Um, conscientious. This is, this is the guy that's going to want to know how many kilowatts he's going to save. How much energy am I going to save? Is there going to be net energy savings? We, we try to be really careful with that and talk about efficiencies and not energy savings because energy savings, especially in coastal environment, when you don't have a high cooling load, we're transferring energy from one cost to another. There may not be a net savings per se, but there might be a long-term savings over the rising gas prices. And these people are going to respond to the idea that the system is uh, future-proof. This is where we're going. The experts are saying gas prices are going to quadruple over the next 10 years. You're going to be avoiding that cost. These people are going to be okay with hearing that and be, be okay with, with um, having that be part of um, their decision-making process. And these are also the people, and if there's any salespeople in the audience here, we get these all the time. Conscientious people are a lot of them are engineers, and engineers don't like to waste a BTU. So when they hear that the water heater, as it heats water, creates cool air, a lot of these people want to go through drastic, ugly measures to try to capture the small amount of cool air to do something else in the house. And defusing that situation... Um, you'll get used to it once you do it a few times, but defusing that situation is there's not enough usable cooling out of one of these units to make it worthwhile. And if we put something together on your system to do that, we could be causing other pressure differentials within the house. So if we explain this in a way that is also going to to kind of um, treat their their uh, engineering um the, the way they think as an engineer, it'll be easier to offset this problem. We never get I's or S's that want to capture that cold air. It's always the C-type personality. So you know who you're dealing with if you're coming into that. And then we have the lovely D's. Now, all of these personalities are going to come into one of four different quadrants. And so the S and I's, we are big on relationships. We want to build relationships we have a conversation with somebody and we leave and and on the way out of that conversation, we're wondering, what did that person think of me? That's an I thing. The sympathetic person in that relationship is they don't want to lose face with a, with a uh, relationship and they want to do whatever they can to. They're the ones that are holding the door open on the elevator and they want to please everyone so that they can build relationships that way. And then down here, we have the task oriented and then the lovely D's. So the D's are the drivers. The the D I have some friends that are drivers, and they're they're, you know, a couple of my friends that are the drivers, they never get my jokes, right? They they think I'm being serious, even though they've known me for 25 years. And um they're the ones that don't really care about the uh the operational efficiency. They're 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 less caring about the way that you know we we sell a lot of our systems based on the fact that we put the right size system in so if you leave it on it uses a tiny little bit of energy to keep your house warm these guys don't care about that they would rather i want a system to come on and heat my house up quickly these might be customers that are going to want a bigger system um, these are also ones that are going to want you to do things like hey do you install on saturdays because god forbid i can't take a day off work or it'll be easier for me to do that. They might even be willing to pay extra to have something done on an, on an off day so that they can be there and supervise. D-type personalities uh, might leave your guys alone until the end and they come out and they go, why didn't you ask me before I did that? And they're, they're going to be more direct. Um, 
they are also going to be the kind of guys that are that are mostly and through my number of years of experience selling to D's, they're going to be the ones that want two choices. And it's a 50 50 shot, whether they take the higher choice or the lower choice. And it's probably going to be based on what their mood is in. And they will make they will make judgment decisions based on impulse with their personality that negatively affect them in the future. And they won't think twice about it. And they don't, they don't even care because they made the decision. The decision is final. Um, we had a customer we dealt with decent, uh, recently and he needs two systems for his house. And he was care He was comparing our two system price to his friend that got one system. And our two system price wasn't much more than double his friend's one system price, but he couldn't get around the fact that what we were doing was $35,000 and what that guy did was $16,000. And, you know, the, the explanation of you're getting two and he's getting one and you're getting better than he was getting, it, it didn't it didn't resonate with him because he had it in the back of his head that he should be able to do this for a significant cost, even though he had two systems. So uh, you're not going to, when, when you do the sales approach like we do, which is consultative and um, technical, um, the drivers are probably not people that are going to buy from you. Probably drivers aren't ever going to make it through our process. Our process at our company is com a customer fills out the form online. It auto generates an appointment and then they have to wait to talk to somebody sometimes for several weeks and D type personalities aren't, aren't, aren't interested in that. They don't have time to fill out a 15 minute form. And this is why we have it set up that way. If I can't get a customer to get skin in the game before we talk to them, they're not going to be our customer anyway. So it's just a way that we kind of weed these people out. So not there's just anything wrong with any of these personalities. It's just all these four quadrants we live in. These people are these task oriented people. Like it's got to be done. This one, it's got to be done super. Um, it's got to be done super correctly. This one, super fast on my terms. So watch out for these people, figure out who they are, tailor your conversation. So when we understand the customer's needs, then we got to kick it in. And remember, as I personalities, as salespeople, we have two ears and one mouth. We need to use them in that order. I've been selling for a long, long time. Um, and I still have a problem with this. Sometimes when a customer says something and my brain registers that as, as something that I can enforce the need, I can't stop myself from talking. I have to, I literally, a word will come out and I have to stop myself and I'll say, no, you finish. I have, even after all these years, I have to consciously do that because of my personality type. Um, ask open-ended questions and listen to the whole answer without butting back in. Another thing about high personalities. Um, ask the following uh, the follow-up probing questions. So we tell our we tell our students ask questions and devise questions around the five um, the five benefits of a, of of a properly installed heat pump. Ask the questions around those. And then find out if the customers, uh, if that's a customer's need or not. You'll you'll find out really quickly. So the idea of an open-ended question would be, um, Mrs. Jones, I noticed that the return air is is right adjacent to where you guys sit and watch TV. Is noise ever a problem with the system? They're going to tell you very quickly. Oh yeah, you know we have to turn the TV up anytime that system comes on, and it's really annoying. Then we can ask another question. Do you ever not run that system because of the noise? Or um, do you have to turn the TV up? Is that a problem? Is that something you would like us to deal with in this installation? That probing question. Mrs. Jones, do you have any allergy or asthma problems in the family? No, we don't. How about the guests that come over to the house? Uh, not really that I know of. Is dust an issue in the house? We ask a few questions to try to see if indoor air quality is something that they're going to clue in on, and maybe that's a need for them. Um, are your utility bills, Mrs. Jones, what did it cost you to heat your house last winter? We know gas prices were extremely high. Um, yeah, it was really expensive. What did that do to your budget? Were you caught, up, were you caught by surprise when that bill came in? Yes, we were. Um, we always ask, what has interested you in doing electrification in your home now? Some of them will say, I've been doing research. Uh, well, Mrs. Jones, what research have you done? Well, I've been reading a lot of articles online. What have you taken away from those articles that interests you? 
So ask these probing questions and keep asking questions until there's no more answers and then go to the next topic. That's the way we do all these things. And then we can dial in on what the customer's needs are at that point and um, really get down to brass tacks. So uh, make notes, make sure that you got a notepad in front of you and you're writing these things down. And so we do a we do our virtual assessment. And oftentimes I'll take my my face away from the camera and I'm writing and I says, I said, just a moment, I'm just taking this note down for you. This lets the customer know that what they said to you is important to you and you're going to consider it. And then take those notes at the end and make sure you incorporate those into the explanation of the system. Like if they told you that unit is really loud, um, I, and I'm writing that down. I'm going to I'm going to put in the detail that this super quiet system um, will provide uh, all the all the energy savings you need, whatever the cost was. But I'm going to put something in that's going to emphasize what their what their trouble points were. Okay. Site evaluation is really, really important. So we've talked to a lot of HVAC companies out there during doing our trainings. We ran about 150 companies through our training, just over 200 some individuals. I'm, I don't have the most accurate recent numbers, but what we have found is uh, most companies think they're the best company out there. No company is ever going to come tell you that, you know what, we're cheaper, but we're going to do a bad job, right? So they don't, they don't do that. They, 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 they understand if they're coming in with a low price that you should understand that that low price is going to come with less, less quality um, or they're going to have to cut a corner somewhere because you can't do stuff for free, right? So there's things that are going to be omitted. Um, but a lot of times the, the contractors don't do site surveys. And so the, the extent of looking in the attic space is popping the hatch open, looking with a flashlight and saying everything's fine. And, there, and you can't do that. But we need to understand as salespeople when we're going in behind other companies that some of the guys out there are doing that. So the more time you go up and spend in the attic space, and when I'm doing that, I'm taking 25 or 30 pictures in the attic. I'm pointing out everything I can find that's an anomaly. And this to me is something I would point out. I would point out the, the, uh, the turning of this flexible duct and how the flexible duct pinches up on the inside and how this causes uh, static pressure inside the system. And that static pressure inside the system is going to create more fan energy. And these problems right here are going to actually cost them money. And then, uh, then I can justify the expense of fixing this problem. Uh, we also have this picture on here because this is a this is a compressed fiberglass branch. Why this was used wisely, or excuse me, widely from the '80s through the '90s, and even now today, um, by um, in track homes by the companies that get the stuff and done quickly. And a lot of times these companies are actually putting these together at the shop and delivering them out to the field. And so sometimes the installers are actually cutting these ducts to fit and making them fit fine, or other ones are just attaching them and leaving all the waviness. So we see this as, as problems that we find in track houses a lot, but these compressed fiberglass wise are something we should always consider for replacement. We should be explaining to our customers that these are not good for them that the fiberglass inside of here can delaminate, especially if they've got an oversized furnace and the air temperature is really high over a long period of time, it can cause that fiberglass in there to delaminate and get into the air. So these are the reasons why we wanna do these, these um, site assessments. The attic evaluation is the most important part. We're looking at insulation, we're looking at the ductwork, we're looking at these triangles. Uh, we're looking for the waviness, we're looking for any place that's come apart, we're looking for any place that the Vapor barrier has delaminated and is falling apart. We can see the duct underneath. And we're taking pictures of all of these things. So when we come down out of the attic, we can share these deficiencies with our customers so we can get their buy-in on fixing this stuff. Uh, inspect insulation quality and R value. We're looking for interstitial wall cavities, air leaks, bald spots, light cans, and bath fans. So if we're working in a two-story house that has the furnace in the attic space, we know everywhere where there's a duct downstairs, somewhere there's an interstitial wall cavity where that duct goes downstairs. We should be fixing those as part of our prescriptive approach. 
when we have interstitial wall cavities, and what that is, is it's basically an open wall area, like a soffit where a duct goes down through or a flue goes down through or something goes down through. Those should be patched so that we don't let attic air become part of the inside of the house air. So we're looking for those. Um, we're looking for bald spots in the insulation, take pictures of those. So it, it helps us sell the insulation part of the project. Um, we do need to explain to our customers how our insulating over the ductwork is going to be more beneficial for their energy saving. We need to be looking at the light cans and determining if they're, they're, they are IC rated, insulation contact rated or not, and what our strategy around that is going to be. And we need to be looking at the bath fans, uh, making sure that the ventilation is connected correctly. If we've got a bath fan that, uh, for some reason, if, if, if any of you guys worked in the, in the trades and, and see the actual attics, Bath fans are often installed by the electrician and then the sheet metal guy comes and hooks up the pipe to it. And in my experience, they're always put in backwards, right? So the pipe has to come out and do a 180 degree turn to get out. Um, if we see that, that's good. That's a good reason to, to sell an upgraded bath fan and put the thing in right and vent it right. Uh, note all the gas appliances when you're doing the site evaluation and talk to the customer as you're doing this. And we, we basically do this virtually, like what other gas loads do you have in the house? <clears throat> the, the one customers aren't sure about a lot is the dryer, but people know if they're cooking on a gas stove, they know if they have a gas water heater and they know if they have a gas furnace. And we're, 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 we're taking that information down so that we can help let them know that a full electrification of your home is going to require replacing all of these. That's going to have an impact on the choices that we want to make now for your electrical panel. And then talk to them about this so that they understand that full electrification means getting rid of all of these. You will have these awkward conversations about stoves because for whatever reason, the stove is the worst appliance in the house for air quality, but it's the one people want to hold on to the longest. <clears throat> and people that have gas ranges, a lot of them have microwave hoods that don't actually exhaust the air out. We also want to take the opportunity in older houses and look and see if the, if the kitchen fan is exhausted out. And we don't want to do a whole bunch of attic work and prevent them from being able to, to exhaust their fan out. So add that to, to your repertoire of running those running those um, those fan vents as well. Size up the floor plan. Uh, we always just <clears throat> take grid paper, do our basic calculations on grid paper, two foot per square, measure everything out. I usually I always do two foot per square in case I forget to put the dimensions down. I could just count the squares. Um, locations where the appliances are count all the registers, gather the sizes of the registers because that's going to come in handy later because if you want to put in a good heat pump project, you need to change the registers. And then take tons of pictures because you're going to need them later. <clears throat> Present your findings to the customer. So presentation of the discoveries, we want to sit with the customer and go through. One of the things that I was used to do, take the pictures on the iPhone. I don't know what kind of technology you're using. Take the pictures on the iPhone, airdrop it to the to the iPad, and then share the pictures of the iPad going into detail about what the deficiencies are and what we're going to do. Um, don't go up in the attic and take a bunch of pictures and just keep them in your phone and not do anything with them. Even if the job is already sold when you go out there and look at it, you want to reinforce the, the, what you're going to do, and you also want to get the detail of what needs to be done. Uh Share their electrification opportunities with them. Um, so, you know, Mrs. Jones, you do have the dryer and the stove. Uh, neither one of those are pre-wired. What I found is a lot of my customers, the stove ends up dying one day and you, you need a new stove. And if you have to get an electrical circuit ran to it, you're more likely to go buy another gas stove. It would be really convenient if we ran the, the electrical for you so that when that happens, you can just plug a new electric range in. Would you like to pre-wire for that? Same thing with the dryer. You know, I have a story about that myself. My gas dryer died one day. Fortunately, my house was pre-wired for it. So I got the electric one and plugged it right in. But if that was the case, it would have thrown off my entire electrification, my, my own home electrification um, kind of calendar um, because my gas dryer died about three months before I was going to put in the electric dryer. So I was forced to do that early. If I hadn't had that electrical out there, outlet there, I would have had to have gotten an electrician. I would have had to go to the laundromat more days. It would, it's, it's just a great idea to do that. Heat pump water heaters as well. Uh, Mrs. Jones, I've noticed that your water heater is, is gas. We're not going to take care of that today. I think it's a really smart idea. It's, it's, it's 10 years old. 
Water heaters don't always last longer than that. And when water heaters die, they always do it in one of two ways. They either stop working or they flood your garage. So we need to get a water heater back in very quickly. I think it would be smart for us to pre-wire so you can get a heat pump water heater put in immediately. How do you think about that? Make sure we understand that customers and are, a lot of these people are going to buy EV chargers later and buy EVs. One thing people don't know is they go out and they take a test drive in an EV and they buy it and they figure out they can't charge it on their existing electrical system. They didn't think about that first. Um, people are going to install batteries and solar. All this stuff is going to take up space in their electrical panel. They need to understand that. And then they need to know the solution for today's needs. And um, right on time, we're going we're gonna to get into the common objections and how we deal with them. And um, just just so that you can enjoy the the coolness of that uh, with the animated background, I just I feel like I'm traveling through space. So there's a lot of misconceptions with um, uh, with heat pumps still going on. the The thing about heat pumps is they've been around for a long time. I've been in the trade forty years. I worked in Redding, California for a while. It was really cold and really hot. A lot of houses up there have heat pumps because there's a lot of country houses out there that are out beyond the gas lines. So a lot of houses with heat pumps. 40-year-old heat pumps suck. 30-year-old heat pumps are, aren't great. Almost all heat pumps that have gone in in the last 30 years aren't that great if they were installed outside the gas territory. And then we're going to take those not great heat pumps and install them in houses with people that were, are, are getting rid of furnaces. So it can leave a bad taste in the mouth if we only take our experience of dealing with heat pump customers and try to bring that to customers who have lived with gas, it's going to be a problem. So we need to set expectations and we need to put the right systems in that are going to improve their life and not just what we like to install. So we still have a lot to learn about this and uh, we still need to figure out how to come over these outdated objections. So some of these are Where's my cursor? Hello, cursor. No, uh -oh. mouse isn't working. Hold on. Here we go. All right. All right. Small technical glitch here, folks. Sorry. Very strange. This one hasn't happened anymore. Application is not responding. I do not want to end the process. Sorry about this, guys. Okay, here we go. All right. So trust your product, right size heat pumps, the five big benefits. So these are the things that we talk about with our customers. Notice one of these is not saving money. I don't know if every one of my customers is going to save money with a heat pump. There, there's customers out there that just have heating now that are going to be switching away from just heating and now have an air conditioner. If they now have an air conditioner that they're going to use, that net in, that net cost of energy over a year's time might be significantly higher. I do know that with my customers that have existing air conditioning and they're living in air conditioning dominant territories like where our business is, um, uh, and up north towards Sacramento and down through the Central Valley. Um, those customers, if they have air conditioning now, chances are we put the right heat pump in, they're going to save a lot. My house um, here in Vacaville, my heat pump that I installed uses less energy in the entire year than just my air conditioner used to use in the summertime. And I have a very efficient house and I had a pretty efficient air conditioner. So I know in certain situations, my, my house is going to save money. My, my customers are going to save money. And I know in certain situations, it's questionable whether they will. The other thing is a lot of the people that we're dealing with, especially the conscientious personality types, a lot of these people haven't ran their furnace to keep their houses comfortable. They've ran their furnace for survival heat for the, for the last number of years. So these are the ones that say, I let my house get down to 50 at night and I turn it on for an hour in the morning and I wear a sweater all day. That customer may or may not save by putting in a heat pump. You're going to have to put in a really good, very efficient heat pump for that customer to be close. So we only put in really good, very efficient heat pumps. So we get good, we get good um, 
outcomes from those. We did get a Yelp review recently and the guy says, I waited six months to give you the review because I wanted to see what this was going to do in the winter. And I just wanted to tell you it works great. And my instead of my bills being hundreds of dollars a month, they are now tens of dollars a month. That's a good review, right? We put in a system that's actually saving that guy money and he was a heating dominant customer. So um, he is also in the Bay Area. So he's likely not using the cooling side of his system very often. But so these are the five things that we talk about. Better comfort. And if you're going to talk about better comfort, you better deliver better comfort, right? We better not put a big um, unitary heat pump in here that's going to turn on off all the time. It's not going to work when it gets below 40 degrees. We better not do that if we're going to talk about better comfort. We better not to do a like for like box swap if we're going to promise our customer a quiet system. We're going to have if we're going to promise our customer a quiet system, we need to put in a quiet system. We need to put in a, a system that's the right size for the house so it's environmentally friendly. We want to put in a system that has the least amount of refrigerant in it. So if it does have a leak, God forbid, it's going to be the less impact on the environment. One that's going to use less energy over time. One that they can charge up their house and keep it warm or cool and use less energy keeping the house warm or cool. These are the envir environmentally friendly things. Safer. Obviously, if we're putting a heat pump in and we're electrifying the house, we're getting rid of the gas. We're getting rid of the possible combustion problems. We're getting rid of the, any, any chance of any kind of CO issues. Um, which brings me to another thing that just popped into my mind. Why do the inspectors still need CO detectors if we fully electrify my house? Don't know, but they'd still ask for it. So safer. Indoor air quality. We're installing systems that are right size for the house. These systems are going to run for a long time. And when I combine these with good filtration systems, I am really increasing the indoor air quality of the house because my system is running much longer, which means I'm trapping more particles because I'm moving the, I'm, I'm changing the air more often in the house per hour because my systems are allowed to run longer. Sizing is incredibly important. And this is where building science comes in. So here we go. Objections. It'll cost too much. We hear this one not as much as we used to because we address this one in our presentation. We tell our customers when we share our, our mission statement that we are providing the most efficient, cost-effective solution possible. And that doesn't mean that that system has the highest SEER number or anything like that. It means that we're sizing it right for the house. We're taking into consideration how they're going to operate it, and we're going to instruct them on the most efficient way to use that system. And we're typically putting in systems that have a high inversion rate. In other words, they slow way down and they speed way up. Um, so the way to justify this in, in via, or the cost, if they're saying the, the heat pump system is just way more than a furnace. So, so, you know what, Mrs. Jones, you're right. This $14,000 system is significantly more than a $6,000 furnace. But you have to put a $6,000 furnace in anyway. So we really only need to justify the differential in the cost. Now we have $8,000. It is more than double. But we have, we have the prospect of gas prices going through the roof. You experienced high gas prices last year, and that was painful. So the operational cost of this system will offset the additional investment over time. Isn't that the type of system you would like? Easy. Uh, what's improved safety, health, and comfort, and the productivity that that will bring to your, to, to your family? What is that worth to you? What are the environmental benefits worth to you? Uh, we had a customer call recently and cancel an appointment. It does take a couple of weeks to talk to us. And she said that uh, the contractor before uh, came through and said a, a heat pump wouldn't work in her house. So, and she was, she went and bought another furnace. So she's going to be stuck with high rates forever. Um, rebates and incentives are, or will be at an all time high. This helps offset the cost. So, with the incremental savings that you will get operating the system over your existing gas bill and the future gas energy cost, and we combine that with the incentives that are available for this, that really brings the price of this down to a manageable amount, wouldn't you agree? Uh, we have several financing options to help you with this um, so that you can, you, you can uh, purchase this system that you know is right for your house and you said fits all your needs. We can help you with financing if you would just like to put the down payment equal to the furnace cost, and then we can finance you for the rest.
um, or the ROI guy. The ROI, what is my return on investment? That's how we know when they're getting asked, the ROI guy comes through. I know a D-type personality got through my process. Yeah, that's your, uh... All right, so electricity is more expensive than gas. We hear this quite often, and sometimes it is. And electricity is slightly more linear. It's not going to go up as fast as gas prices are. Uh, and natural gas prices are on the rise. Everybody saw the high gas prices last year. So it's really, there's some pain in recent memory that we can use to justify this. Um, but gas prices are likely to continue as fewer paid to maintain the infrastructure. This is the way we, we talk about this. If you look at the way the gas prices are structured, there's actually a gas procurement fee and a gas delivery fee. The gas delivery fee is the part that covers the cost of the gas infrastructure. The gas delivery fee is the part that kind of stays static, but that's carried on every therm. So each customer is paying for the maintenance of the gas system by buying those therms of gas. As fewer and fewer people buy therms of gas, the people that are still remaining buying gas are going to have to pay for that. That is going to drive the gas cost up. Then we have the procurement fee, which is the actual cost of the gas, which is, uh, is volatile. It can go up and down uh, depending on availability and what's going on in the world. So gas prices are volatile and unpredictable. And electric prices, even though they are always also going to rise, and sometimes in conjunction with the higher gas prices, they are at least going to be manageable. Also with electricity costs versus gas, I could put up solar panels and I can completely eliminate the cost of that. Um, so solar plus heat pumps are very attractive. The You do have solar on your house, Mrs. Jones. It would be a great idea to take advantage of that energy that you're producing now and not have to worry about those higher gas prices. Um, and there's zero marginal cost if your system is operating off solar. This is a pretty easy one to get around. I won't have heat if the power goes out. We still hear this once in a while. Like um, the, the, the wife and the family really wants to do this, but the husband is concerned that if the power goes off, they won't have heat. And I have to break it to them gently that the furnace that you have in your house now also runs off of electricity, right? It's not going to change anything. And um, you're still going to be running off electricity. So usually it doesn't take much conversation past that. And they go, oh yeah, you're right. Now we do have to talk about that with the heat pump water heaters, right? Because your water heater still runs off gas, even if the electricity is off. That's a good reason for, to have a bigger water heater, right? The bigger the tank, the more, the more water you have sitting there. If this is really a concern for you, Mrs. Jones, your house says it's the two of you in a one bath house. You could get away with a 50 gallon water heater. We should put an 80 gallon water heater if you're worried about the, the uh, not having a lot of hot water if the power goes off for a day or so. Um, small inverter systems like we install, uh, they can be ran off batteries or backed up with generators, some of them. Um, and then how often does your power go off? Tell me a little bit more why you're concerned with that. Do you have frequent power outages at the house? Get down to the brass text. This is a good opportunity to ask a probing question. A lot of time you're going to find out that uh, either the power never really goes off. I just hear people talking about the power going off. Other people are going to tell you, we live right in the foothill, so our power goes off for five days at a time. And um, I, I would say we need some sort of an energy backup system on this house, then if that's if that's a concern for you. So, um, and also we got coming down the pike, battery integrated appliances are coming as well. So that's going to be pretty cool. There's a battery integrated stove that's coming out, 110 volt plug-in induction range, has a built-in battery, charges all day uses the battery for anything above a normal plug load. Amazing technology coming down the pipe. Um, so it's exciting about all the cool stuff that's coming out now. Hear this one pretty often too. What about the grid? You know, they tell us all the time, the grid, the grid, the grid. Well, realistically, the grid does have a lot of capacity. If we were to remove a lot of the funky, unconventional air conditioning systems or the old air conditioning systems that use a lot of energy or bad heat pump systems and put in good inverter heat pump systems that use a lot less energy, then we wouldn't have all these grid conversations. But 
Also, you know, the grid has a lot of capacity. We need to be more mindful about how we utilize our new electric appliances, AKA we need to electrify your home efficiently. This is a good argument for why we want to put the most efficient system in possible. Um, customers uh, don't have resiliency in mind. Most of the customers that talk about this have just heard people talking about it. It's pretty easy to get around. Um, we think that the, the work that's going on in the grid with the CCA is putting all the all the um, the renewable energy into the into the market now. Um, I think that this is unfounded. Now, when we start talking about charging electric cars and the grid and then electrifying might be a more tantalizing conversation. Um, but unless you're talking about that at the same time, I wouldn't bring it up. And then also during the grid. So if you're worried about appliances that or or the grid are you participating in any um any time activated reduction programs or or load shifting programs or um do you currently prescribe to your utilities demand response program if they don't then they're not that that important on it and then we can also suggest that like when you're with your water heater, Mrs. Jones, we can program that unit to work when power is more likely to be up or when your solar is producing. So it's less of an issue. Heat pumps don't put out hot air. Get asked about this all the time. The reason the reason people don't like their heat pumps, and, and we hear this a lot about traditional heat pumps, they blow cold air and they do blow cold air. Um, they're not necessarily the best setup. And this goes back to designing the right system for a gas customer that has a heat pump. If you've got a customer outside of town that's never had a gas furnace, then that customer's used to the, the the way heat pumps work. You put a better heat pump in, they're gonna they're gonna kiss you on the mouth, right? The we're taking out of gas appliances, which we we say is 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 a cross between a um, between a a Hummer and a Prius, right? A, a lot of power, really fast. A sports car versus a Prius, or a sports car versus an electric car. Um, we need to design the systems right so they don't do this. So this is all covered in part of our process. As we as we talk to our customers, we talk about the fact that we need to put new registers in your house so we can direct the air away from the occupants and not cause any drafts. And we're very particular about talking to our customers about once your house gets warm, this system will, will reduce its capacity to a point where we will be maintaining the heat in the house for with it with temperatures just a few degrees warmer than room temperatures and that can feel breezy so we are going to take the extra measures to install these registers that are going to keep the air off of you we want you to feel the comfort in the home not the uncomfortable air blowing on you inverter systems most of the good inverter systems out there now don't have problems with throwing defrost air but traditional single stage heat pumps or uh, or single speed heat pumps do go into defrost cycle and they do basically go into air conditioning mode and the indoor fans continue to blow. So the inverter equipment, the smart equipment doesn't do that anymore. So be cautious of what you're installing. Some contractors are installing those with gas furnaces as backup heat during defrost. I've seen this happen for years. We were talking about hybrid systems 10, 12 years ago as this great option. But the problem with them is, is sometimes your, your um, defrost cycles are only five to seven minutes and it takes a minute and a half for your, for your furnace to even come on. And then it takes two or three minutes for it to come up to temperature. And you've already been blowing cold air into the house for three, three minutes. So but that that's not really a helpful solution. And we've kept the customer with gas. The other solution is to put an electric heating element in there. And when that electric heating element comes on for just a few minutes, it throws off the performance of the system for hours. So it uses so much energy in that short period of time that it throws off all the efficiency. So um, we just talk about that. The body has many heat transfer mechanisms and most of it is radiant. So if I'm filling your house and getting all your furniture and everything in your house at one temperature, the mean radiant temperature in the house is going to be room temperature. So if we keep your house warm with the solution that we are offering, we don't have to worry about it putting out hot or cold air. Heat bumps don't work when it's cold outside. You know, I've heard these things don't work too good when it's, when it's cold outside. And I'm like, yes, a lot of them don't. This is why you have to have a correctly designed system. 
Uh, this opens up the conversation to, to the customer for a better system. This is not to be looked at as a reason for you to go, yeah, you're right, they don't, let's just go with a furnace. We need to talk about the BTUs around us, right? And and um, getting your house warm and keeping it warm so your system outside doesn't have to work as hard even when it's cold. And then we need to put in systems that can operate at the temperatures that are the design temperatures of your area and even colder. Inverter technology now has the ability to operate down to five degrees with most of the traditional equipment at least some manageable capacity. And then there's there's cold climate heat pumps that we can install that will work down to the sub-zero temperature, some of them 15 degrees below zero, put out a significant amount of heat. But when we do that and it gets colder outside, we need to make sure that our building shell is good and our system is installed right and it's sized properly and the airflow is designed for room to room applications. At that point, the house is already warm. It gets cold outside for a number of hours at night. The unit is going to have to ramp up to maintain it, but your house is already warm. So we're not letting it get hot and cold between cycles. So that's a, a better argument for putting in a better system. Man, we hear this one all the time. Like, there's no way I'm going to put that thing on my... We literally have customers call not understanding that there is technologies for heat pumps other than wall mount units because of whatever research they've done. And they go, well, we're really looking for a solution that doesn't look like this, right? Doesn't look like this thing. Now there's some ways around this, like you could go get some contact paper on this and make this part of the decorating in the house. Some people might do that. Um, LG makes a pretty cool unit that looks like a picture frame. I mean, ultimately, if it came down to that, these are really gonna be one room solutions. And there's this, these new solutions that you can <clears throat> put a wooden grate over it, but uh, what we see a lot of times is if you're doing these wall mounted units in a very small house, it's not necessarily the look of this unit, but it's how far it protrudes into the room and how it kind of feeds your eye the fact that it's taking away from room space. Um, and then putting some sort of a shroud around it might not be better, but there are these, these solutions out there to hide these things. But the best way to hide a um, inverter mini split system is to install it ducted instead or put one in the in the ceiling. So these ceiling units are much more sleek. You're still going to see it, but it is going to be in the ceiling. Quick uh, tip on these, they don't work in vaulted ceilings. Don't put one of these in at an angle. But why not go duct it? <clears throat> so we had a customer the other day called from some company or some uh, Marin County and um, had a couple of estimates both companies wanted to put in a three zone mini split. This is about a 700 square foot house. To do a three zone mini split, we would have had to put a 24,000 BTU system in because we have to match the capacity of each room's unit to the outside unit capacity. It's just, you have to do that to get it to match. The customer was really kind of adamant about this was the way to do it. By the time we got done with our conversation um, and talking about how we could we could install a system that presented more like a traditional um, forced air HVAC system, and we could get this unit into into a smaller space that they had in the house, uh, they were completely shifted over to now. I want the option for the ducted. That's the price that I want. And now they're going to move forward with the ducted system. Um, if they would have went with one of those other contractors, they would have had all these issues. One of the things you need to understand, we can talk about that on a different uh, on a different call. So go ducted. So I've heated my home with gas for 50 years. Why should I change? I've had somebody recently um, tell me that they still have faith that California is going to change direction on where we're going and everything is going to be fine and gas will be reasonably priced again and somehow... All this forward motivation that's been going on since the, or really because all of this stuff has been tracking back to the early 60s with the with the um, the the forming of the first air board. This has all been coming, and there's still people out there that think that this is just a fallacy or a fad, and it's not really going to happen. So, um, I use the analogies like a couple of years ago. It was really cool to see a Tesla on the road. It was like, wow, look at how cool that car is. Now you can't stop at a stoplight without seeing six of them, right? Electric cars are everywhere. The proliferation of this equipment is everywhere. We're seeing articles and everything about electrification. We are not going back to gas. So the drivers here 
are um, the reason California is getting rid of gas is already written into legislation. We're not going backwards. This is going to cost more for gas over time. The reason are the pollution and the uh, and and the environmental issues trying to get away from the gas. So once we explain what's going on with the gas and 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 give them some reference to like SB 32, we have a chart that we show every customer of the timeline of where how California, the 2030, the 2035, the 2040, the 2045, all of the goals California has, all of the laws that are written around it. This is not going anywhere. But I still have customers say, I'm just going to stay with gas. Those customers are going to eventually have to change to electric. Anyway, this is another conversation starter with, with California is no longer going to sell gas furnaces after 2030. In the Bay Area up here, you can't buy gas water heaters after 2027. And you won't be able to buy gas furnaces in, in the Bay Area after 2029. So my thing is, you can keep your gas furnace and you can keep moving forward with that. But if it does last through 2029 and you squeeze that much, much more time out of it, you're going to have to install a heat pump anyway, and you're going to have to do it at 2029 prices. So we can either adopt this and do it now, or you can do it later under duress after you put a lot more money into energy between now and then. So uh, I will also go into the safety issues if that was one of their if that was one of their pain points. And once I've discovered what their needs are, I'm focusing this conversation around their needs. But once I've gotten to the point where I've discovered what their needs are, this is not usually a, a um, objection that we hear. This is one that gets heard though, when we're converting from gas. <clears throat> How do I know it will be reliable? Um, despite being new in the US, heat pumps have been around the world for decades. Um, I. I I travel the world once in a while and I'm guilty of taking pictures of heat pump systems all over the world. I often show these to people when I'm just as a gag when I'm out at the house. But, you know, I've, I've focused this company where people are calling me for heat pumps. So I don't do a lot of these objections anymore. But between 2015 and 2020, all of my jobs I sold were all converting gas customers to, to heat pump customers. So it was a bit of a a, a, a harder push back then because there wasn't all this ancillary information out in the world. Um, and it was, it was hard to talk about this, right? So if my machine runs all year round, does that mean it's going to last half as long? How do I know this will be reliable? I can't ask any of my friends. None of them have these. So we have to talk about things like, you know, we are a diamond dealer with this particular brand and we can offer you a 12 year warranty. We're going to be here to back you up. These systems have been around the world for forever and they're just coming to the United States, they're tested and probably more reliable. The systems we install, sometimes they'll say, um, if, you, <clears throat> if you bought your car and you immediately took it on the freeway and you only put all the miles on your car on the freeway in cruise control, it would have very little wear and tear on your car. You wouldn't be using the brakes, you wouldn't be starting and stopping. The systems we install are much less likely to fail because they run more consistently because turning on and off is the hardest part of the system, the hardest work for the system to do. And that's what typically causes the systems to um, wear out quicker if they do. So this is another way I can transition into a better system. Um, point out how your quality procedures are going to better ensure longevity. Sure, Mrs. Jones, if I put a traditional heat pump in here without doing all these extra measures that we need to do, that could shorten the life of the system. That's true. This is why we need to do these extra measures. So you have a system that's going to last a long time. When I install a system that has a correctly designed duct system, and I have very low static pressure because I've designed it that way, this system doesn't even have to work as hard as it's designed to work. It will last longer. Discuss your maintenance program at this point. If you maintain this system with us, we will carry your warranty, your labor warranty out as long as you have a maintenance program with us, which is what we do. Um, extended warranty options and other things. So this is a fairly easy one to get around. This one is really easy to upsell better equipment. <clears throat> so we hear this a lot too, is um, I read online that heat pumps are really loud. So Mrs. Jones, you're right. Heat pumps are very loud. Some heat pumps are. Other heat pumps are very quiet. It depends on what type you want to invest in. Is noise 
a major um, concern of yours. Maybe we look need to look at this different option for that. Or the system I designed has very low decibel range because we design these for city areas like yours where they have sound ordinances and clearance issues. I've already taken that into consideration in my design. Not all heat pumps are created equal. You should not be able to hear your neighbor's heat pump over the fence like your neighbor's air conditioner makes that sound. So there's dozens of systems out there that run far quieter than your existing AC system if you have one. I don't have space for that outdoor unit. With the systems we install, we can always find space, right? So what one of the things we found out near us is <clears throat> um, some of the cities are willing to not worry as much about how much space there is on the side of the house if we put the unit up where you can walk by it and not your head, your head on it. Um, or we can hang them on a wall. We can put them under a deck. We can uh, put them up on the roof if that's what you want to do. Uh, but there's a lot of options with smaller systems. This is one of the reasons why we don't do the unitary stuff. Um, so lots of options there. It's not carbon friendly because electrical comes from fossil fuels. So a bunch of studies have been done. This one from the Rocky Mountain Institute in 2020 said out of the out, out of the lower 48, 46 of those states would benefit. There would be a net benefit by switching to an electric appliance because they generate their power from clean sources. A couple of states use a lot of coal. So you using more electricity going to mean they have to burn more coal. But then last year or the year before, Rewiring America came out. They looked at the, at the fugitive emissions that are involved in all of this stuff. And they found out that 98% of U.S. households would cut their carbon emissions by installing a heat pump today, even with the um, the coal being used as a primary heat, uh, energy source in some of the states. So this is powerful information if it comes there. We even had a customer, like customer's husband, the 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 the, the, the the wife was completely into it, and the husband was kind of more of a D-type personality. Interesting conversations probably go on in their house. But he was like, um, if we put this thing in, uh, there's embedded carbon in all of this. They took the carbon to build it. And it, that was an easy one. It's like there's the same amount of embedded carbon in the process of building your existing air conditioner and furnace that you're going to need to replace anyway. It was an easy one to get around, but. So I prefer to sleep cool at night. And you told me that I need to keep the temperature or keep the house the same temperature all the time. I just tell them about how I use my house. Um, small thermostat setbacks are okay. You can turn the thermostat down a few degrees when you go to bed and it's not gonna use a lot of energy the next morning. What we're concerned with is if it gets really cold at night and you, you turn your system off and you have to recover in the morning, um, the system is going to use a lot of energy and it's going to take a long time. So to keep the house more comfortable, i.e. charged up, we just run the system for a longer period of time, uh, leave it on at that temperature. And if you want to keep your bedroom cold, we can just shut off the vent to that room if, if you want to keep it cold all the time or do what me and my wife do. We just open the winter. We just open the window in the winter and let the bedroom get cold and shut the window in the morning. And then we're walking out of the bedroom. I've got a nice warm house to go into. I don't have to worry about charging it back up and I don't have to worry about using excessive energy in the morning to uh, get the house back and toasty again. Because some heat pumps, realistically, if somebody let their house go to 60 degrees at night and it's 32 degrees outside, uh, doesn't matter what heat pump you put in, it, they might be on their way to work by the time the house gets comfortable again. I mean, you, we explain all this to our customers in front and how they should use the systems, and it, and it gets rid of a lot of these um, a lot of these objections on the front side. So that's our program for today. I hope it was helpful. Um, you can scan our QR code there if you're interested in doing more training. Um, this is a great picture of one of the trainings we did up at the Sonoma Clean Power Center. And uh, thank you guys for, for listening. And I hope that was helpful. Do we have any questions, Alex? Um, we don't have any questions in the chat. So if anyone has any questions or something you'd like to ask Larry, we'll hang on a couple more minutes. Um, in the meantime, uh, as Larry mentioned, here's our, our uh, flagship training for tech. Um, we have a few book sessions and there'll be one more in April. 
these are for participating tech contractors. So if you're not a contractor yourself, please uh, go ahead and forward the information to someone who might be interested. And then um, um, maybe Ian will mention this at the end, but there's going to be a lot of great 3C REN trainings coming up next year as well. So Larry, if you want to advance uh, the slide uh, once just to give our contact information uh, right there. And then uh, let's see, I'm seeing one question come in. Uh, what brands of system do you sell? So uh, we, sell, we sell, we um, sell, we sell Daikin. We sell Mitsubishi. We sell Fujitsu. We sell General Electric. And um, we sell Bosch occasionally, depending on what the application is and what we're trying to do. All these systems have different operating capacities. If, if, if I have a house <clears throat> that is, we talked to a customer yesterday, um, her house, she's not going to be able to do her insulation or her windows for a couple of years. Fujitsu is the system we're going to on that one because Fujitsu has the highest over ramp rate. In other words, with their rated capacity of 18,000 BTUs, that unit will put out like 26,000 BTUs of heating and it will slow all the way down to 5,400 BTUs. So they've got a good low end modulation rate and they've got a good high end rate so then when they put those windows in and they insulate that house that system is just going to adjust down its capacity and it's going to have a new lower high end it's going to automatically itself adjust for that so we only install inverter systems some of them are fully communicating inverters like those those i told you the bosch system and the ge system those are called temperature pressure inverters those they work a little bit differently they they slow down the system operational capacity based on what the temperature of the coil, the, the the refrigerant is inside the coil, which directly relates to the return air temperature. The downside to those is if you have bad duct work on those, they will never fully ramp up because they're always going to see larger temperature differences than they should. They're extremely critical to install properly. <clears throat> All right. Uh, go ahead and advance one more slide. Not seeing any additional questions at this time. So uh, Ian, we'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, and thanks all for joining. Um, just a few things before we close out. Um, there were AIA and ICC learning units available for today's seminar. Um, we should have gotten your information in registration, but if by any chance you left that out and are seeking these learning units, please reach out to me. I can get you set up with those. Um, we will be sending out the slides, a survey, and the recording of today um, should go out at some point over the weekend. It's an automated process, but um, you'll receive those shortly, um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and then just to highlight, we just released our Q1 and Q2 courses for next year. We have a ton of stuff scheduled. Um, but just highlighting a few of these January and February trainings um, for your awareness. If you're interested, check out our website, register for what looks interesting to you, and please share with your network. Um, with that, if there are any remaining questions, we can take them or we can close up as, as needed. Um, it looks like a question just did come, come through, Larry. Uh, how do you seal or fix interstitial, inter Stitchial ducting pro problems. Actually, we're going to have <clears throat> we're going to have another we're going to have another webinar on that. <clears throat> but the but the hardest part or the most important part is to discover them. So if you know you're in a house and, and there there's a lot of them in two story houses. If I have a furnace in the attic and I'm providing duct work to the downstairs, we need to find out where those ducts are traveling through the attic space and going through those 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 spaces. And basically we fix them by putting foam board in around it <clears throat> and expanding foam around everything. <clears throat> Just so we're, we're isolating that cavity from the attic space. What happens is if you have that cavity and you're cooling your house and there's hot air in the attic, it will draw the hot air in the, from the attic down into the interstitial cavity. And it'll create these hot spots on the walls that your air conditioner has to overcome. In the winter time, those become very cold because they become closer to ambient conditions of the attic space. And then they actually 
pull the heat out of the attic. So just sealing those with foam board and, ex and expanding foam, depending on the house you go to, if you have a furnace in the garage and it's going up to a two-story house, you might have or two, two, two story and delivering ductwork from the top. You might have a really big chase with a small duct. Same thing. Cap it off with foam board, seal around it with foam, uh, expanding foam, and make sure you look at all the angles, make sure there's no openings anywhere. Because even a small hole is an interstitial cavity, but really, really important to seal those foam board, expanding foam. Super easy. Awesome. Thank you. Well, all right. Very uh, good. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Last call for questions. Otherwise, we will leave you to it. Happy Friday, and thanks for joining. Happy Friday. Merry Christmas, everybody. If that's what you guys are into, whatever. Happy holidays. Uh, we'll see you next year. All righty. Thanks, all. Take care. Bye.